is that it is Prospero's incestuous desire for his own daughter. In the island for 15 years, or for 12 years at that moment, the girl was 15 years old, and they were living alone for 12 years, and there were not another woman there. So, Octav Manoni argues that the problem of Tempest is the problem of repressed desire. Not that he has expressed his desire for his daughter. So what happens when you repress your desire? This is the question of Oedipal desire. In this case, it is the opposite of original Oedipus's desire. Son's desire for mother, here is the father's desire for daughter. And another writer, Robert Samuels, who is much younger, he's younger to me, even born in 1961, another Lacanian, who comes to Lacanian psychoanalysis through Slavo Zizek, whom you know. So he's a Zizekian, rather to say, a second generation, let us say, or rather third generation Lacanian. He argues that it is not a problem of incestuous desire. What is it? It is a problem of, he calls a homoeroticism. It's a homosexual desire. Caliban's desire, prosperous desire for Caliban. Believe it or not. So these are so preposterous arguments that uh, one often hesitates whether to discuss this with his students. But since Shakespeare, has written almost about everything, why he should leave this out? So let's see, what, is, what are the two arguments? What is the insinuation or proof of incestuous desire? Is this desire is repressed? Then he says, everybody would agree that Prospero charges Caliban for attempting to violate Miranda. This is what Mr. Octop Manoni suggests as a symptom, as an expression, what he calls identification of Prospero with Caliban. It is Prospero's own desire for his daughter he projects onto Caliban, and so he charges or accuses him of attempting to violate Miranda. So this is actually Prospero's own repressed desire that expresses itself as a charge against Caliban. This is Manonian explanation. Yeah, so Manon is, that is a quote I took from him uh, in my slide, which is hardly readable, so I'll read here. The inferior being, in this case Caliban, always serves as a scapegoat. Our own evil intentions can be projected onto him. This applies to incestuous intentions. Miranda is the only woman on the island, and Prospero and Caliban, the only man. Yes, I made some spelling errors, so please bear with them. I printed it quickly before I checked it out. So anyway, what is Robert Samuel's criticism of this? He says that it is not so much, yeah, this was desire, racism, projection, and identification. These are the four psychoanalytic terms Mr. Samuels is presenting in his book. Uh, he has a book uh, by, well, it's published in 2001. I took it from base. Uh, I forgot the name of the book because it's not yet very well known. I just downloaded it. I found his argument this way. He, this is a long quotation from his book. If you care to read it, please do once. He says, for these psychoanalytic processes tend to dominate the entire construction of the play. What are these processes? Identification, projection, desire, and racism. So then he says this. Yet, I do not believe that it is a question of incestuous desire that serves to motivate the movements of repression and projection. Rather, Robert Samuels argues, I would like to insist that it is the rejection of a certain homosexual desire that is the central cause of the play. Now, I would like to argue with this Mr. Samuels, and also I would like to reject Octav Manoni's suggestion. So the third position that I take within psychoanalysis is what I call Lacanian position. What is the Lacanian position? It is, it is not to be construed in a vulgar way. Lacan says man's desire is the desire of the other. Like, I do not know of any text where Lacan discusses the tempest, but he discusses profusely Hamlet. There he says that why Hamlet 
hesitates or procrastinates. This famous problem, Lacan gives an ex excellent explanation in my opinion. He says, Hamlet's desire, as often suggested by such psychoanalysts as Freud, is that he has an incestual desire for his mother. This has been insinuated in many films and in interpretations. But Lacan uh, begs to disagree with his master, Freud even, and Ernest Jones, as you know, Paul Freud's famous biographer. They are explicitly, there is a book called Hamlet and Oedipus by Ernest Jones. Lacan is at pains to refute the argument of that book, saying that Hamlet's desire is not directly the desire for his mother. His desire is for his mother's desire. So he has two imperatives, two obligations, one to his father's instruction, take revenge, another to his mother's desire, don't take revenge on my lover. So if the two are acting as opposed to each other, centripetal and centrifugal, the result is a stasis. But finally, once upon a time, he was suffering from stasis, but eventually he once succeeded when his mother was already on her way to death. So this complex explanation of Lacan's, which, is, which he taught in the late 1950s in a seminar, his famous seminar number six, I take a cue from there. This is my genealogy. Then I apply this to the Tempest, where I say, what is Prospero's desire? Not directly a desire for his daughter, but a desire for his daughter's desire. What does his, de what does his daughter desire? Of course, Ferdinand, but not as much as Caliban. But if you go through, if you go through other things, Samuel insinuates another. He says, there are, in Act 3, there are two marriages. One is the prospective nuptial of Ferdinand and Miranda, and there are another which must not be overlooked. This, I must say, in tribute to Robert Samuel's insight, that there is a marriage between Stefano and Caliban. There is homosexual marriage in the marriage. No, people doesn't really often attend to this. When he was found, for example, in, inside the gabardine of Trinculo, what is it? Yeah, she, homosexuality, of course, every, at the reader of his sonnets know was no, nothing strange in Shakespeare's time. So there is a clear, the act three has two marriages. And I will give you chapter and verse here, and you will see. But I have restrained myself a little bit in the interest of time and space, but you can always go further. Anyway, let's see. So can we go a little bit back? Homoeroticism, as previous ones are, uh, right. This is, he says, in act three, we witness the development of two marriages. The first involves the potential nuptial between Ferdinand and Miranda, and why the second concerns Caliban and Stefano. And in, I will talk about Miranda later a little bit. The mirror is to see. And she's a mirror of, step, of Prospero's desire. So I think this is a better, in my opinion, pardonably, a better Lacanian uh, explanation than Samuel's or Octave Manone's. So what I'm doing here is an only an inner feud within the Lacanian family. That's why I use the word later, since Lacan. When I promised that I would be speaking on after Lacan, I said it's better to speak, because I'm not really representing Lacan. I'm only being one of the many Lacanians. So please bear with me. This is of no interest to non-psychoanalysts. But for literary analysis, it is bearing. So let's go to the, now my explanation begins with uh, seven. So since I'm using a new thing, man's desire is the desire of the other. If we have to understand this argument, we have to understand the concept of small a. A bit complicated involved, but I beg your pardon to bear with me for three slides. There I give an explanation, and it has also been given to you in the so-called prospectus that I gave you, which may be compared with overture in music. A little bit of an overture. The object small a, I took it from many Lacanian dictionaries and many people's writings. It is a kind of compilation. As for, in Gonzalo's speech and many other places, Shakespeare verbatim copied from Mothe, the essay on the carnival. So I did the same business here. So do not accuse me of plagiarism, because many people have contributed to this. The object small a, which is an original contribution of Jacques Lacan's to psychoanalysis, at least Lacan claims so, it is my only original contribution. What is it? Stands for a simple idea, a part object. To give an illustration, for the child, it is the mother's lost breast. 
on which we all once upon a time supposedly were fed, if not for artificial, what is the non-organic food these days, which causes colitis of some kind of, <laughs> what do you call it, Ulcer, ulcerative colitis. So with complex functions, here is the problem. This small a, in Lacan's evolution, it changed from one idea to another. First, it was a pure object. Later on, it became an object which itself has a desire. So he, here is the implication of Caliban. What is Caliban's desire? Is he a masochist? One who enjoys his punishment, etc. These questions will come up. The small a at first designated the other, in French called l'autre. The word a comes from this small French word. L'autre, the other. And Lacan takes the first letter a for small letter. In so far as the other appeared to contain something made in the object of desire. In distinction from the other with a capital O, in this play you will say, Prospero plays that role, father's role, when he says that I, this, my daughter is my gift, though you have acquired, you achieved her. So this will be law of the big other, which is God, which is father, which is patriarchy, and all. Referring to the field of the unconscious. This is a compressed Lacanian idea. The unconscious is structured like a language. And the unconscious desire is the other's desire. So these are all implicated. Later, by later I mean in 1970s, when Lacan, Lacan taught for five decades, from 1930s to 1970s, 28 years of lectures are published in 28 volumes. These are called the Seminar of Drac Lacan. Every year on, for six months, he used to weekly lecture, every Wednesday at 12, and he precisely ended at 1.10, 1.20. And never there was an exception except in 1964, the year he was expelled from International Psychoanalytic Association. So I'm referring to 1970s uh, seminar where he says this, Later, the object, small a, came to stand for a part object, not as the object of desire as such, but more like the subject of desire. This is something will entirely throw you out as confusion. Many of my colleagues say, oh, I don't understand Lacan at all. Or the guy is convoluted, he is obfuscating, but I will ask patience. Because it's very immensely rewarding. I'm a very small witness, but if you need a witness, I will say, there is not a single thinker in the entire Western tradition, since Descartes at least, who can be in any way remotely compared with Lacan. That is why I insist on understanding when you say, now it moves from an object, a part object, to a subject who desires. Though it sounds convoluting, but there is reward. We'll see this. Or rather that which shapes one's desire. Many, that is to say, causes desire by giving the subject's desire its itinerary, its orientation, its direction. It is only in this sense that we can approach uh, Mr. It is called Idol Leto Hoyna, sir? Oh, good. I'm a choker to show much of the time, it's dure de ki kasa de ki na, and Joshma Tad just put the usual down. Lacan's thesis. So, I continue. This small a, among its other functions, specifies the subject's desire in order that an orientation of desire can be sustained. This is the abstract argument. How? In addition, it disguises the subject's experience of lack. What does it lack mean when I say I miss you? Because I'm missing you, so I want you. What does the word want mean? It means both. You are not inside me. I'm wanting you. That's why I desire you. So in English, desire means I want you and I lack you. This is, Lacan says, the double experience of the subject of lack. We all, when a man meets a woman, thinks that when I meet her, we will fulfill each other. But after meeting, we say we both have created a bigger hole, a bigger missing. This is Lacan's statement. The subject's experience of lack in the illusory promise of achieving the object of desire. And also, serves to locate the subject in an unconscious fantasy, which may be called the originary fantasy. Since our birth, we get away from our mother, the lack is created, then, then in order to fulfill the lack, we always run after one object after another. That is why desire is never ending. Says, as the 
subject to unconscious fantasy that serves as the support of the other's desire. The object small a in this fantasy stands correlative to the subject, a relation that typically becomes the primary aspect of the transparency. This is another psychometric concept when you see it with your analyst and you tend to fall in love with the analyst because the analyst is a subject who is supposed to know. Sujet, supposé, savoir, that's as they say in French. A subject who is supposed to know. This is called transference. This happens between students and teachers, between father and daughter, and in all kinds of that situations. And there is a concept called counter-transference as well, a teacher falling in love with the student. It also happens. But I do not need a new theory for that. It is transference, transference reverse. So, and so the next one, so this is a big Lacanian slogan. Remember, my slogan has no organic connection with what I had wrote in there. They are both separate. Man's desire as the desire of the other, but this is other with a capital O. In the course of the analysis, the object small a drops away. I want, now my question would be with regard to Tempest. Whatever has happened to the play at the end, Prospero, is he really cured? Prospero has a disease, I will assume. Now, has he really been cured? Now go to the epilogue and what the 20 lines of the epilogue uh, shows that he has not really been cured. This is my argument. Okay. Though he thinks that he is cured, then I'm not in every third thought will be the thought of my grave, but it's like every third thought would be the thought of his power, still. So, ego, or the origin of all of our original fantasy, has not been cured. And Caliban has not really kept, relieved him. We'll see this. And the word Caliban, incidentally, has some connection with the name of Lacan. You will see this later. Yes, Ben Ben Ka Caliban. He says, this is an anagram of Cannibal, but this is also a slight uh, suggestion of Lacan's own name. Lacan himself is like a Caliban within psychoanalytic literature. We'll see this. So what happens here? If, however, I call it constitutive fantasy, it is that every man's fantasy, since you enter into language, now the language plays a big role in this play, as you know. He did not know language, he was taught language. What does it mean to teach someone language? What happens after you enter into language? That's a big psychoanalytic question. Language cures, but it also creates neurosis. Here is the problem. In the course of the analysis, the object small a drops away. As you will see at the end, they will cast away, they will leave Caliban in the island, bare island, and they all will sail for Naples and Milan, and see, so that in the end the subject is freed, here understand by the subject Prospero, is freed from neurotic constraints, hysteria, obsession, these are neurotic constraints of the constitutive fantasy. If, however, the subject is constrained to identify herself or himself with the object small a as correlative with the other's desire and then carries out the object's fall, quite concretely in a suicidal act, the analysis runs aground. That means the analysis is not successful. My argument is that Prospero's cure is not a complete cure. We'll see. And therefore, at the end of the epilogue, we return to the same first scene, big storm, tempest. The word tempest you remember, has a reference to time. In French, T-E-M-P, temps is time. Tempest, that happens over time. So there is a cyclicality. That means the disease has not been cured. So I will proceed now. Now we will have many quotations. So I will now run through the quotations and our analysis will be done. Prospero's identification, how it happens. For example, at the end, when Alonso says, what is this thing? They always refer to him as a thing, you see. Then Prospero speaks in Tempest, Act 5, Scene 1. Well, only one scene anyway. But in order to fill in the blank, I put it one, because I miss it if it is not there. So, lines 272. In different editions, you have slight variation, you know this. So, ignore that. It says, these three have robbed me and this demi-devil, referring of course to Caliban, for he is a bastard one. These are fantasies. Had plotted with them to take my life, which is a fact. Then, two of these fellows, you must know and know, Stefano and Trincolo, that this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. 
this is what Dr. Manoni and both uh, Samuels indicates as a kind of erotic desire repressed. This thing of why thing of darkness, what does it mean? It's a metaphor, of course, of ignorance or everything. Everything, what is called the scapegoat, the inferior being. Of course, that is the darkness. This is the European metaphor of enlightenment. One who does not speak, nature is dark, right? Only culture is light. You just cannot afford to ignore the dialectic of enlightenment. By the way, I may make a parenthetical remark. Dialectic is never between matter and spirit. As often many historical materialists in the name of Marxism have used it. Dialectic is always a spirit dialectic. It is always between subject and object. That's an aside. And in order to get this, you must go through Georg Lukács, History and Class Consciousness. All other writings are, I would say, trash on this question. Because they do not really understand what dialectic means. It is a much abused term. I say the dialectic of the unconscious, where I mean unconscious subject and unconscious object. We'll come to this. So here is our overture. Then identification. How does Caliban look at Prospero? He makes reference, when I was young, thou strokest me. You might take it innocent, of course. The world is innocent, but language is erotic. You see, when thou camest fast, Thou strokest me and made much of me, would give me water with berries in it. This is Caliban speaking vis-a-vis -vis Prospero. Now why are you harsh? In the whole play, in, the, in anywhere in play, you will never see any closeness between Prospero and Caliban. He's rather harsh with him, calls him a bastard, calls him a thief, everything conceivable. So there's no question of any erotic closeness to them. But there is nevertheless a repressed desire. What about Caliban's desire? Though I call him a small object A, but he's a subject according to the later Lacanian gospel. So this is gospel according to Saint Lacan. And says, and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less. Now the metaphor of teaching is the by binary system, by opposite. Refer to those of my students who happen to be here for them beyond the pleasure principle. Fuch and da. Yes and no. Present and absence. Light, big light. If you go to Dhanmundi street number 32, you say there is a key. Tarokar Raja Chandro. Brikke Raja Shurjo. Are Deshe Raja Pita Bangabandhu. Read it there, it is there. So it is something like that. Metaphor is really the expression of the unconscious. You will see that. <laughs> to name the bigger light and how the less that burn by day and night. You see, again, day and night, the metaphor of bigger light and smaller light, and then I loved thee. It's human desire. Then I loved thee and showed thee all the qualities of the eye. Is the source of knowledge. I have not quoted the much obvious ones. When Prosper would be speaking to Miranda, saying that, yes, we need him. He is the source of our knowledge. We don't know sweet water. We cannot tell sweet from the saline water. We do not have a source of our fuel. Fossil fuel, probably. <laughs> Who knows? He knows all our full body. He knows all our nuclear plants. Okay, that is why qualities of the eye. So now look, I, I have castrated my talk today because I want to make it limitable within 45 minutes. Here is another castration. Who is Miranda? Of course, in classical Freudian, Miranda is the one who lacks the phallus. But she too claims that she has the phallus and Caliban does not. What is phallus here? Language. She said, abort slave. She derives her life from the bigger life, from her father, from the other, big other. But in the game between Miranda and Caliban, they were supposed to be close. You see, when Prospero and Miranda arrive on the island, why island? It's a sign of exile. But exile is not only alienation, but also pleasure, you know? Being alone is, you know, for making love, being alone is lovely. So that's why it's a place where they make love. But the problem is that there was no other woman. There are only two men. And 
and one is suspect, whether he's a man or a fish or a demon or a monster or a slave or a child. So let us begin when they were child. According to the myth in the story, when they arrived, Miranda was three years old, and according to calculation you can make within the play, Caliban was about no more than 12 years old. So they were of the much same age group than Prospero and Caliban. So if any closeness you can imagine between two children, these were between Caliban and Miranda. So, but now she grew up, she's 15, and accusation has already taken place. It is post. He is now imprisoned in the rock, he says, about slave, which any print of goodness will not take being capable of all ill. You are unteachable. Nature. Is nature incarnated in Caliban? So, for example, sexual transgression, natural transgression, not being able to speak are all related. Raw nature, uncooked. So here is the contrast between the raw and the cooked. Here is the origin of table manners after a certain uh, man called Claude levi -Strauss. Here is the origin from ashes to honey or the naked man. Take the titles of four books of the mythology. These are all compressed into one. Shakespeare is, of course, a great compressor machine, uh, almost a cyborg. Shakespeare is a big cyborg. And you see, he says, I pity thee, took pains to make thee speak, bastard, taught thee each hour, one thing or the other. When thou didst not, savage, know thine own meaning, but good. Gabble like a thing most brutish. I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. But I gave you signifiers. You were only a mere signified. And the, but thy vile race, my friends, especially my dear fellow students. I'm a student too, so I have every right to call you fellow students. We know the word race did not exist in the, its present sense in the English language before the 16th century. After Columbus, this was borrowed from the zoological literature to human parlance. Another word, civilization did not exist before the 18th century. So these are contributions of the Shakespearean or pre-Shakespearean or Columbian, let us say, enlightenment. So what? When the word race is used, Shakespeare, this is no more than 100 years old then. Race, it was applied to animals only, now it's applied to mankind. And this racism is the only enemy of humanism. When Europeans speak of humanism, they are always being ironic. Yes, because the moment they started speaking of humanism, they were already practicing racism. Simple differences. Racism means mankind are invariably different. For example, we are different from animals. Racism means that blacks are as different from whites as animals are as different from human beings. That is the sum and substance of racism, which you see now even in France. Jo Sui Charlie. This is pure and simple. That 16th century racism 500 years later. Yesterday I had a meeting with the Swedish ambassador in the presence of Professor Anderson Jamal. We had this discussion. They admitted the main problem in Sweden or France today is not religious bigotry, but a question of racism, but disguised. So psychoanalysis is among its other vices, has a vice of pointing out racism. I'm indebted to Robert Samuels' analysis, but though I disagree with him on other fine points, but this is the point he made. So it comes. Though thou didst learn, I say, a thing most brutish. That means a brute is an animal. So Caliban is a black man, maybe African, maybe American Indian, or people as Shakespeare scholars say, oh no, he's a Tunisian. He's from the Mediterranean. Because they were moving from Italy to Tunis, the marriage was taking place in Marisa, why it should be in the Caribbean? Yeah, but imagination knows no one. You know Shakespeare's theater was called Globe Theater. And here also he says, my own very globe. Globe is not a word invented yesterday. So here, a thing most brutish, brutal. I endow thy purposes with words that made them known, but thy vile race, through, though thou didst learn, had that in it which good natures could not abide to be with. Therefore, 
wast thou deservedly confined into this rock. So what is Miranda doing here? She is providing with our public relations officers. <laughs> yes, our cabinet secretaries usually do on behalf of the prime minister. This is why this person has disappeared forcibly. It's like this. Why he is confined to this rock, who has his desire more than a prison. You see, this is like an emergency legislation in our kind of old third world countries. Your movement is confined. It's like trucks filled with sand. Are you saying that your movement is confined with this? Good, so far. Now, Prospero, let's take a look at him. It is at the end. Now, what did Prospero say? It is in the fourth act. And I have made it like an omelette. You know, everything is this is scrambled egg everywhere. I'm just moving back and forth. Our rebels are now ended at the end. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits. He takes control as the big other. The whole world is a stage. So then why not the stage as a world? Exactly, the stage is a world too. So let's talk about the characters. When the end, everything ends, what remains? Our life well, is rounded with the sleep. Frank Carmode explains rounded means crowned. Our life is a small segment between two long sleeps. He doesn't say that. Shakespeare says rounded with the sleep. A long sleep, rather. Our revels are now ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud clad towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself. Globe theater. Yeah, all which it inherit shall dissolve. Looks like he is now facing his liberator. And like this insubstantial pageant, faded, leave not a wreck behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. And out, little life is rounded. Our, it should be our, our little life is rounded with sleep. So you see the lack of care that I had to take. Anyway, now look back, rather a short quotation. Just to remind you, in the first act, second scene, Caliban was demanding his desire through his mother. I said, man's desire is the desire of the other. This is a restatement of the obvious. A man's desire is also desire of his mother. What was his mother? His mother is accused of being a witch. And of course she was pregnant. Who made her pregnant? According to Prospero, the devil himself. That's why he's a demi-devil. He's a bastard. You have seen it. He says, this island is mine. Despite my bastardry, despite my illegitimacy, I am the owner of this island if you have any respect for the laws of human inheritance and succession. Of course, it is a Lockean law who is the first occupier of the land. This is the law, labor law of Mr. Locke. Of course, a little bit junior to Shakespeare, but it doesn't matter, which thou takes from me. Law of appropriation, the island will remain him at the end when the colonials will withdraw. Why do I belabor this point? The reason is that there is a rumor right here of something called post-colonialism. This is what I say. What we really have is a new colonialism, NEO. But this is a big lie to say that colonialism is over. If it were over, I would be the happiest. But it is not. And one of its self expressions is in the hegemony of the golden pillars. One of the pillars is the English language, by the way. But the question is what is to be done? What am I doing here? Let's see. Now, verse. this is the sign that Robert Samuel said, when I insinuated that there is a homosexual marriage here, you might be taken aback a little bit. But you said there is a homosexual act also going on in right in front of the stage. Trincolo says, alas, the storm is coming again. They have just landed. You see, this is in scene two, act two. And my best way is to creep under his gabardine. What does it mean? Two men in the same 
Stefano mistakes him for a four-legged animal. What is this monster? What are they doing? And then he will say, the first cry Caliban makes, oh, don't torment me. Believe it or not. Read it and then refute me and I'll be the happiest. There is no other shelter here about. Misery acquaints a man with a strange bedfellows. What does this word mean? Of course you say, a strange bedfellows is a fish. And in Shakespeare's time, sodomy, an unnatural act, which is punishable in Bangladesh under what is called Article uh, Section 377 of the Penal Court. Once upon a time, as Professor Kaiserhoff was kind enough to remind, I was a student of law. So in Shakespeare's time also, the, the idea of making love to a fish was condemned. So it was, he's being portrayed as a fish and making love. You see here, misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. I will hear shroud till the drags of the storm be passed. So shroud in Indian parlance means kafam for us. So this is also death. Beyond the pleasure principle, death is forthcoming. So Trincolo's homosexuality as dehumanization. If it were simple homosexuality, I would not be talking about it. I'm not interested in homosexuality, for God's sake. <laughs> but I'm interested in humanization. That's why I have to talk to you before this. You see, the problem is that the homosexual partner whom you desire, you also degrade. This degradation of sexuality as pure and simple pleasure is what is at point. And you see, what have we see here? Who says this? Trincolo is talking. A man or a fish? Dead or alive? A fish. He smells like a fish. A very ancient and fish-like smell. A kind of, not of the newest poor John. A strange fish? Where are I in England now? You see, he is trying to make profit out of him. This is what the English is a nation of shopkeepers. We did not have to wait for Napoleon to hear this. This is manifest in Shakespeare. Napoleon did not invent it anyway. <laughs> says this, a strange fish. Where are I in England now? As once I was, supposedly, he's an Italian. So, but within the play, Shakespeare had to guise him as a visitor to England. He was an Ibn Bututa there and says that, and I had but this fish painted, not a holiday fool there, but would give a piece of silver, a rupia, rupataka. So there would this monster make a man. You see, when they will not give a doit, doit is a half farthing, a very small coin, to relieve a lame beggar, they would lay out ten to see a dead Indian. Some people, those friends of English professors, professors of English rather, argue that, no, 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 this took place in the Mediterranean. I'm amazed to read such men as Harold Bloom and Frank Carmode, all of their utter races in so far as they say that, no, no, this is not in India. This is rather in Middle Eastern. They do not even admit that there is any insinuation to this racial bigotry. So, but I ask them, which Indian is this? A dead Indian? It is a metaphor for Caliban. It is not Raja Ram Mohan Rai. This is not from East India. And Indian at that time did not anymore mean this India. So, what is, now say, what is object little a? I have to be a little bit, I will not wax much, but I will be a little bit theoretical, saying that, uh, Many students of Slovo Zizek, uh, they, uh, Mloven, Dolar, and others, they speak up, gaze and voice as object small a. What you fall in love with, you say, oh, I have this experience. Many women told me, oh, I like your voice. And don't you like me? Well, no, I like your voice more than I like you. I say, oh, good. My voice is therefore enthralled. Gaze and voice, Stefano says the same thing, you see. He is in his feet now and does not talk after the wife, he shall taste of my bottle. He will put him some wine in his mouth. If he had never drunk wine afford, it will go near to remove his feet. If I can recover him and keep him tame, Stefano is speaking, I will not take too much for him, he shall pay for him that has him and that soundly. That means Caliban is a saleable commodity. As such, 
already slavery is in the offing. Though we know it takes a prospero to say that I have imprisoned you because you tried to attempt, you tried to attempt to rape my child. But here already, they don't know this, Stefano and Grancolo, they are already trying to make profit out of him, to sell him out. Of course, Shakespeare is an encyclopedia, so everything is there. Four legs and two voices. This is the gaze and voice. A most delicate monster. His forward voice now is, is to speak well of his friend. His backward voice is to utter foul speeches. So both Trincolo and Caliban is within one gabardine, and he's seeing, I could not figure out which way who is. Four legs in one side, or two legs on both sides. And Robert Samuels is a bit, I would say, preposterous in saying that. There are two forms of discourse, oral and anal. Both discourse are at work here. What you call fart, in German, fart means to go out. For example, if you go to highways, autobahns, you will say fart, this way, get out. So they were, he was both foul speech, he's farting. His backward voice is to utter foul speeches and to detract. What? If all the wine in my bubble will recover him, I will help his ague, ague, a kind of fever or his cum. Now, cum is another word in English, you know this. The Shakespeare is such a hilarious pun maker. I think even Lacan is amazed by Shakespeare. So anyway, Caliban and Stefano's relationship with him. Why Caliban worships the man from the moon? Why he's so fool? Is he a masochist? Does he love being tortured? He first said, I love thee to Prospero. Now he knows that Prospero will never love him. So he comes to this. Has thou not dropped from heaven? Then he says, he is deceiving him. Out of the moon, yes, I do assure thee. I was the man in the moon when time was. This is Stefano tricking him. That is, I have seen thee in her. And here is homoeroticism again. Caliban's eroticism is expressed. I have seen thee in her. In her means, now what do you see? You see Molana. What is he? Saidi, on the moon. So he was seeing the moon. And I do adore thee. My mistress showed me thee. This mistress means he is referring, I believe, to Miranda. <coughs> because I told you the bigger light and lesser light and thy dog and thy bush. And you take the references from there. I don't want to bother on that. Yes. So, but then he is committing himself again to Stefano and Trincolo as I showed the fountains and the sources of pleasure, berries and fruits of the island, to one's prospero. Now to you, I show thee every fertile inch of the island. And I will kiss thy foot, I pray thee, be my God. Why does he need a God? Again, man's desire is the desire of the other. You get your own desire delivered to you as the voice of the other. Almost. It is not only Islam or Judaism. Every other religion speaks of scriptures as coming from the other. And only through, and even in Freudian folklore, you will see in Totem and Tebu, you have to kill your father in order to get the uh, law from there. And then you have to refuse his daughter, his woman. So anyway, I'm, now we are about to finish. So Prospero's, let us return to Prospero's original. They are both in Ida's powers. Prospero, as the big father, is it so? Or am I only fantasizing? So Prospero, who saw, he saw the Ferdinand and the Miranda man. As a father, he has his repressed desire for his daughter, but it is for an alternate purpose. He wants her to be married in a heterosexual way. So Robert Samuels' argument is this, that our society is homosocial because we are all male society, at least at that time. Women are not allowed to vote. Women are not allowed to be present in the public. So in order to repress homosexuality, we establish homosociality and establish heterosexuality. And here is Prospero's desire for man cannot be realized unless he re-emphasizes his role as a patriarch in ensuring heterosexual marriage. So he has been at pains, at anxiety, for making sure that his daughter gets married to a proper man. Now the proper man has come. 
But first half is the only man, first man after her father. So they are both in either's powers. But this swift business, he knows I must make uneasy. Lest too light winning make the prize light. So he torments Ferdinand, but I will not waste much time on that. He makes him carry logs of woods, which was often uh, actually assigned to Mr. Caliban. Should I say Mr.? Yeah, the fish Caliban. Now, now see, Miranda, I'm making my business short now. I'm running a ground. I will finish soon. Miranda is Narcissus. Miranda says that I never saw any other man, even for that matter, no other woman. I have seen only myself in my mirror. If you read Joshimuddin's Bengali Hashid Galpo, you will see that there's a funny story about the discovery of the mirror in Bengali countryside. So here is a little bit of that. I do not know one of my sex. Miranda is speaking here in, when meeting Ferdinand in the middle of scene one of third act. One, no woman's face, remember, say, from my glass, my own. Except my own glass, I do not remember any other woman's face. I saw mine in my own glass. Nor have I seen more that I may call man than you. Good friend and my dear father. Of course, Ferdinand, except you and my father, I have not seen any other woman. Man, how features are abroad, I am skillless of, I am ignorant. This is an old Shakespearean word, skill is of, that I do not know. But by my modesty, the jewel in my tower, I would not wish any companion in the world but you. She is taking an oath, in the name of my modesty, I am modest, I am still a virgin. Modesty in the 17th century meant virginity. Therefore, because I am a virgin, that is the biggest dower. The concept of dower in patriarchy is already present here. So, Ferdinand, a, a little bit away, is talking about the same topic, saying, that I call it the inversion. When you are made to suffer, so even like, you know, Ferdinand carrying log, can be a symbol of phallus. And um, at the end, so when uh, Prospero left his scepter, so again, so uh, there is again another phallic symbol. So he, he is leaving his phallus, you know, and now, you know, uh, making a compromise with his old enemies and going back to old Europe. So, uh, you know, so how, how of Ariel, I left it out not on purpose, but because I was running out of time. I, I typed it until 11.30, so if you give me time. I wanted to insert him, but I managed to forget. This is my great unconscious. I wanted to. But anyway, he has a function here. In order properly to understand Caliban's function, it is imperative that we go return to the politics of the island. I mean, Caliban, if he represents some kind of a rebel, I would say, Albert, a masochistic rebel, that he wants to be loved, but when he is rejected, he can even kill, so he wants a kind of a recognition. I say this is the hunger for recognition. But in what position, that's a different question. And a good reference that can be made is to Franz Banu's works. But how about Ariel? Let me read out a para from George Lemming's work, then it will clarify my position. But we must return to the politics of the island, he says to Ariel's function in this drama of intrigue. For Ariel, like Caliban, serves Prospero, but Ariel is not a slave in the design of the play. Ariel has been emancipated to the status of a privileged servant. In other words, a lackey. If I may use another word of Spanish origin, a comprador. In Bengali, a mutsuddi. So what does he do? He is also seeking his liberation, and it gets kept. Ah. Well, what's it called? Ariel is prosperous. His, what is his function? What precise job does he do? He's the chief of the spy. I mean, he's the only spy at this moment, but he's one of those. He says, Ariel is prosperous source of information. His liberty is always postponed, but he too seeks liberty. And the great liberty seeker in the uh, play is Caliban. He, in that part where he sings, 
uh, ben ben ka kaliban, freedom, freedom, freedom. That is his freedom. But even Ariel also seeks his freedom, but by different means. As you know, war is a continuation of politics by other means. So, and also intrigue is also a continuation of politics by our secret means. He too has his politics, but he, he has one problem, one vice, he often forgets. That's why Prosper says, do I have to remind you again? Did I remind you last month? Right, she says this. This is George Lemming. In fact, this is the beginning, founding text of the new, what you call post-colonial criticism. Uh, and as has been recognized by Roberto Fernandez Retama, who wrote his famous essay, Caliban in 1971, in Casa de las Americas. So he also acknowledges that to this man. Ariel is Prospero's source of information, the archetypical spy, the embodiment, when and if made flesh, of the perfect and unspeakable secret police. It is Ariel who tunes in on every conversation, which the degradation of his duty demands that he report back to Prospero. And it was due to his efficiency that the conspiracy to kill Prospero was foiled in the end. We know this. Now, in Latin American literature, there was a man called Mr. Rodo at the turn of the century, Fado Siek. That man wrote a book called Ariel, and it became a symbol of Latin American independence movement. Around. And, but even so, the name was Ariel. You know, Ariel is part of the romantic lizard in Shelley and many others. Ariel has got something to do with the year, with Gabriel. You can find his biblical uh, resonations. The point is, in Latin American context, those who are called the Criollos, the white descendants of the uh, Spanish, they became the spearhead of the freedom movement. But they did not include, at least at that period, the blacks and the Amerindians. But nowadays, in the present century, after the Colombian 500 years, the new Latin American awareness is now trying to have an all-inclusive theory where Caliban is becoming our symbol. This was first argued by Roberto Fernandez Retamar 10 years after the Cuban Revolution. And Retamar has another essay called Caliban Speaks 500 years later. So now today within Latin American politics, there is the clash between followers of Ariel and followers of Caliban. But at a certain point, they are allies to each other. Nowadays, Cuba is being open for business, tourism, and hopefully prostitution also. And that's why this was America's brothel, as everybody knows before the revolution. Now they were missing it too much. And a Cuban is also like a Caliban. My point is that it is not yet resolved. The question is in Shakespeare's Caliban, it is good to have an area to make the position of Caliban very clear and contrasting. There are two kinds of colonials. What was Ariel's fault? So Ariel was imprisoned by Sikorax, supposedly, the mother of Caliban, and therefore he was released by Prospero. And Prospero says, have I not set you free from the bondage? So you owe me an allegiance. So you have to be my slave for that, my servant my faithful servant. And at the end you say, my chick, and dear him. Before setting him completely free, he wants him to do the last job for him and give the wind to their sail so that they can reach Milan. So he has not really been completely yet cleared off and OC has not yet been issued by him. So I say, Ariel plays a big role. And about other things, every chapter and every verse can be commented on Shakespeare. I agree with you. And there are so many insinuations. The question is the role of the father. So what I tried to do in the beginning, I said that there are many Lacanian positions vis-a-vis -vis this work. One is Octave Manonis, which is like an old, raw, archaic Freudian position saying that uh, Mr. Prospero is disguising, is repressing, he is rejecting his desire for his daughter and he is projecting it to Caliban and therefore he is identifying himself with Caliban. And after, it is called projection, rejection, identification. They are all becoming, let's say, a cause for oppressing him. So oppression is not only endearment, it is sometimes sadists actually beat up their objects of desire. So in that case, he may be taken as a sadist. 
And Kaliman's own desire for a father, which is, I would say, first natural, then also cultural, can be called a masochistic. So the Caliban prosperity relationship, which Octav Manoni referred to as the psychology of colonialization or colonization, uh, in my opinion, does not quite hold. So then I went to Robert Samuels' explanation that the play occasionally uh, makes insinuation to homoerotic gestures in language and in behavior. One is the Stefano and Caliban scene, even he calls it marriage. And also, with which I began, this thing of darkness, I must acknowledge mine. This can be, I know, given 1,000 minutes. The point is that it is like Murphy's law. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. So the question, if a meaning is possible, that meaning will be taken by the reader. This is darkness secret here. I mean, the, it's, this thing of darkness, that means it can mean many things. This natural object, or this man who is not yet educated, this man who is uncivilized, and so on and so forth. So anyway, I think we may have other questions. So if you, or comments, I think I would like to have a comment or anything. I do not really know everything here. I mean, when you say everything has to have sex, it doesn't mean that a fish is not sexually very attractive, but to some people, then you say they has a bestial nature. So angels, by definition, is that they have been made as a sexual beings. But nowadays, even a few years ago, we used to think that uh, these Harmo Aphrodites, they are not sexual. I mean, this cross-dressing or all kind of third sex was not recognized even yesterday. And now this we are recognized. But even the fish, I mean, when we say that something fishy, but <laughs> often it's something sexual in nature. And then the use of the fish as a fertility is simple. I mean, they're sending fish to the, uh, the groom of the bride's family before the uh, wedding. Yes, yeah, yeah, sir, you made a very important point. Yeah, I agree with this in the sense that in order to stress, emphasize Caliban's rebelliousness, unruliness, or his naturalness, as opposed to culture and, let us say, civilization, Ariel is necessary. Ariel is a contrasting point. Now, for example, she taught me the difference between the big light and small light. So I would say, between two islanders who happen to be there, so another big question is, is Caliban a human being? Or, and for that matter, in the case of Ariel, we know that he's an angel, so not a human being is here. But how about Caliban? I find Frank Carmel is still writing in Ardent Edition and others. No, he's not human. Now, what does human mean within Shakespeare's universe? That's a different question. But for all intents and purposes, we have seen his speaks. How can one speak? Now, Shakespeare is not to be implicated here, but these commentators, these English and other races, they argue that Caliban belongs to a different race and so different that he's not even human. This is the essence of racism. Yeah. That's it. If he's not human, they argue why? For example, say that you did not know your own meaning. Fine. So I taught you every hour, I did not leave you without teaching you one thing. And I did not quote purposely his own saying that, I curse you for learning your language. But the question is, learnability. There's no chance you would say, innate capacity to learn. That is human. You can teach your posha moina, you can teach all kinds of animals, if you love them, shum, shari, there is all mythological birds. But the question of human being, one who can articulate verbal language, not sign language. And a man who can give, oh, these eyes full of noises. And this, I mean, he's as good a poet as Shakespeare himself in the play. Because probably Shakespeare inserted himself into Caliban. So that's why Caliban came out as a good poet. And now you say this good poet is not human. Then you are def defining the nature of human being in a completely different way. The classic definition of man, as given by Aristotle, is man is a rational animal. But this is, I never tire of reminding my friends that the meaning of the word rational in Greek is speaking. If the word in Greek is one who is using logic. Man is a logical animal, 
That is translated in Latin as rational anima. Rational is from ratio, proportion. And in Arabic, this is translated correctly, in my opinion. Man is a speaking animal. Al insan, haywan, nadiku. Which also means man is a reasoning animal. So if Calderon reasons the way he fights for his freedom, that makes him human. What makes Calderon human? I would say it is the single fact that he resists slavery. And he wants his freedom. He says, this island is mine by way of my mother, Christ. Right. Whether he should have made a different article as a reason of first occupier is a different story. But he is human, I would say. Now, Ariel, in that sense, is a good contrast. When God called all the angels, all areas, after creation of Adam, said that, tell me the names of these stars. They can't. They say, Ya Allah, what you have not taught us, we do not know. Then Allah called Adam. And Adam told him all the names of all these stars, plants, and species. Adam almost knew Darwin's original species by memory. He told him all the names of all the evolutionary beings. And that's why Adam became superior over Iblis. Then Iblis refused to bow down before him. And that is the biblical meaning. And I think it is not altogether to be missed in this game also. Wasn't it like, like he was given the job of naming them? He didn't know, like, like he was simply naming them. Yeah, he was given the job and he acquired it. The point is that he knew the names, Ariel did not. In this play, Ariel means all the Gabriels. They did not know. But in this play, Shakespeare is playing God here to some extent. That play that is a God for his play. He, is, he endowed Ariel with all kind of ability to espionage. And his efficiency is remarkable. And he can echo the voice of Trincolo. You know, when he is making... So the question of ability is not a concern here. But Ariel does not know anything that Prospero did not allow him to know. But Caliban knew things that Prospero did not want him to know. So here is the independence of desire. But again, I said that man's desire is the desire of the other. Who is whose other? When we are each other's other, we are small others. The self is an other. This is famous after Rabot's famous statement. But what I saw as the other is the other of the symbolic order. The other embodied in language, in civilization. That is the big other. And in this case, the, it is the law of language which is also the law of the father. So language comes to Calila from Europe, from therefore Prospero, and therefore as Prospero's mirror from Miranda. I'm, I'm just curious, how do you respond to the idea of Prospero as an alchemist? So he's a magician. And he's a scientist, let us say. Yeah. So he's a scientist and he's a magician because he's white magic and Sikorax is the you know, black magic and a Buddha magic. So, so an aerial representing uh, air and fire and element representing fish, earth and water. So the four basic elements are controlled because civilization is about controlling nature. And so the four elements you know, uh, are controlled by Prospero and that's why Prospero, like Prosper advancement. So that's the Renaissance idea of like, you know, control, you know, and the alchemy. So how, how does it like, you know, tag along with your reading? I mean, there are, there are many other plays. There are side plays. For example, Prospero's name begins with a pro. And who dethroned him? His brother, Antonio, who substituted him for his anti. Anti is like Antigone, and pro is like pro. So there is also an insinuation of science. Shakespeare is a great fun maker. So I will not be uh, discovering them again. Uh, we all know that. But the point of their contrast is what I am saying. Uh, civilization means basically we don't need food. This is also in our Indian mythology. Water, fire, etc. But I would reduce them to our new binary. Two, nature and culture. Nature and nurture. That's it. Anything, then not, no education, no nurturing will uh, free him for his disease. That's what is being said here. It is, if Shakespeare is making an experiment, let us say, alchemy is the old chemistry, but alchemy was also representative of all science. For example, mathematics was called nature of philosophy. We have understood. Even Newton, in the um, end of the 17th century, was writing his book, Philosophia Mathematica Naturalis. Ma mathematics is philosophy of nature. 
So the, I would say, yeah, the question is on the contrast, on the binary. Caliban representing raw nature, rebelliousness, and probably when you have same-sex attraction, that is why I find, it, find Robert Samuel's uh, suggestion provocative, that, that civilization, according to the concept of our civilization, civilization has to be heterosexual, otherwise reproduction will not be possible. So it means indulgence an act of repression. You not only repress your child for your mother, you also repress, this is his argument, that you repress homosexual desires, and that promotes you to civilization. So since, so this is being done, so our question is what was prosperous real desire? First suggestion, desire for his daughter, no, repressed. Desire for Caliban, I said no, not Caliban. So desire for what? I said desire for the Lobje Putia. Little object, which is it? That means Lobje Putia means not for one fixed thing, it keeps shifting. So finally, what is the desire? You want to be God. You want to identify yourself. You want to say, an al -haq. I am the truth. That means I march in the, this is the Sufi doctrine. I want to march in the big other. What, what is the definition of the big other? The big other is that other who has no big other. The other that has no other is called the big other. Now, Jacques Lacan's final discovery at the end of his career was that the big other is missing. So what, what he compared, the big other is like a piece of onion. Keep opening it, layer after layer, what is inside? Nothing. So big other may be like that, but then that will deliver you to the shore of atheism. I can't afford to be one. <laughs> anyway, we are celebrating Shakespeare anyway, let's have some drollery. And so I just tried to rebel a little bit, and I hope you will forgive me for taking too much of your time. All right, so much. Thank you.